or address. Hebrews, tw- uh, Hebrews 11, verse 39. And these all, having obtained witness through faith, did not receive the promise, God having foreseen some better thing for us, that they should not be made perfect without us. Let us also, therefore, having so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, laying aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles us, run with endurance the race that lies before us, looking steadfastly on Jesus the leader and completer of faith who in view of the joy lying before him endured the cross having despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider well him who endured so great contradiction from sinners against himself that ye be not weary fainting in your minds ye have not yet resisted unto blood wrestling against sin and ye have quite forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons my son despise not the chastening of the Lord nor faint when reproved by him for whom the Lord loves he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Ye endure for chastening. God conducts himself towards you as towards sons. For who is the son that the father chastens not? But if ye are without chastening, of which all have been made partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Moreover, we have had the fathers of our flesh as chasteners, and we reverence them, shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed chastened for a few days, it seemed good to them, but he for profit, in order to the partaking of his holiness. But no chastening at a time seems to be matter of joy, but of grief, but afterwards yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those exercised by it. So far the reading of the scriptures. Now just a reminder, we have seen how this epistle presents the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus in a very special way, as no other epistle does. And then also his work And then the third part of the epistle starts in chapter 10, verse 19, where we have the Lord Jesus as our conductor in connection with a better walk. We have a better person, a better system, a better sacrifice, a better covenant, and so on and so on. But then also, practically, very practically for us, under his leadership, a better walk. And this walk has two aspects. There is, on the one hand, a walk in connection with the sanctuary, and the Lord Jesus introduces us into the sanctuary as worshippers. That's what we have seen in chapter 10, verse 9 to 22. And then, he leads us through the wilderness. And we have seen that from chapter 10, verse 35 and on, in different um, paragraphs, the life on the principle of the base of faith, basic principles of faith, the perseverance, energy of faith, and now we come to the race of faith here in chapter 11 verse 39 to 12 to 3 and then we have tonight the testing of faith so in connection with this wilderness journey there are different aspects to be discussed Um, so we have seen the last time uh, special examples of the perseverance and the energy of faith and uh, we had no time to go into the details of the end of chapter 11 but we see there uh, how Paul sums up uh, different groups uh, who have shown the power of faith 
in verses 33 and 34. It's very remarkable to see how powerful their faith was. Like Daniel in a lion's den, the friends in the fiery furnace, and so on. But then also, how faith may express itself in a different way, in endurance, in a passive way. And even this passive way is very active because they uh, were faithful in being exposed to all these things. They became strong out of weakness and so on. So that is wonderful to see in verse 35, especially in verse 36, the endurance of faith. And this is what the Hebrew Christians needed, as we have seen in chapter 10, which we need also. And then the sufferings of faith in the verses which follow. And how they were in reproach in this world. We have expressed in our hymns how our um, home is in heaven. The world uh, is a system, a different system, where we have no home. And these uh, heroes of faith have shown all this. And so we come to the conclusion of this chapter in verse 39 and 40. So we have tonight two subjects. The first is the race of faith. And we come into the more details later on. I'll just go through the, the points here. So we have seen this whole gallery of portraits of heroes of faith who walked or ran better the run of faith. And God gave them a good report. During their lives they had already the assurance that they were pleasing God a good report, and God has recorded this report in the scriptures. But there is another point to notice. They did not receive the promise. And that's important to understand. Uh, verse 39 says it, and it refers back also to uh, what he had in chapter 10 and in other passages, that they were still going on without having received the, fulfilled, the fulfillment of the promise. Um, and it is uh, mentioned not even at the end of their lives. We've seen how their endurance went on till the end of their life. Persevered. They persevered in faith uh, till they died. And they died in faith. Or according to faith. As we have seen in chapter 11 verse 13. So there we see that even at the end of their lives. They did not receive the promise. We'll come back to that. And not even when they passed away and entered into paradise. Or uh, however you would call it. Why is this? The reason is given in verse 40. God wanted to introduce first a new and better system of things in Christ. And so Christ had to come first. Christ had to accomplish his work first and be glorified in order that God could bring in this system. But it is, very, uh, it is said in a different way. In verse 40 it says that they should not be made perfect without us. So it's not only because of the fact that Christ was not there and his work had not been accomplished yet but God having in view very special blessings for us so the Hebrew Christians and the believers of this dispensation God did not fulfill the promise yet to the Old Testament saints um the Hebrew Christians had received even more blessings than the Old Testament saints ever dreamed of. Um, it is mentioned in the whole book, we see it. Uh, but then secondly, the Old Testament believers will only raise from among the dead when the New Testament believers will be raised or changed. So that is the second point we see here. Without us, they cannot be made perfect. And they wait for us. When we will be introduced into this heavenly system, then they will be introduced with us. So, this is just the main line of uh, teaching here. And then we come to chapter 12, verse 1, where we see three points, or the three verses there. First, the Old Testament saints there. They are now witnesses to us. A cloud of witnesses. Then we find the Lord Jesus. And we see him not only as the hero of faith, but as we hope to see him as the author and finisher, or the leader and completer. And then thirdly, we are running. That is the three different groups we see in these first verses in chapter 12. 
And then how we can run. We will have many details how we can run this race. And thus finish, we come to the finish. Okay? So, we'll go into some details now and then later on uh, speak about this testing phase. So maybe I'll refer to it uh, during our studies. So, chapter 11, verse 39 is a first conclusion. These all having obtained witness. We have seen on behalf of God, because they pleased God. This witness is also coming now through the scriptures. But for them it was through faith. So their faith, their personal faith, was as it were the instrument. And through this they obtained a good report. God gave them a good report. But it was th through their faith. So it's not just something God gave them. But it was really part of them. It was their personal faith as an instrument to lay hold on God's thoughts. And so God gave them this good witness. But then the second conclusion is, they did not receive the promise. What is this? The promise. Um, in chapter 10, verse 36, we had already a reference to this. For ye have need of endurance, in order that, having done the will of God, ye may receive the promise. Ye may receive the promise. So there is a promise. And we have seen in chapter 3 already a promise that they should enter into the land. So being introduced into the promised land that was for the earthly people of Israel. And I would suggest that the promise is really... Uh, in connection with the Messiah, that this new age to come, as we have seen already in chapter 2, in chapter 6, and in other uh, references, this coming age is connected with the Messiah, and as such, a promise, and still future. And this promise was not yet fulfilled, even at the end of their life, even when they were introduced into paradise, and it is still not yet fulfilled. Although we... And the Hebrew Christians have received, in the meantime, many wonderful blessings. We have seen, uh, and also blessings which are not mentioned here in Hebrews. But, uh, for example, the privilege that he can come any time into the presence of God. It's a wonderful privilege. But he's not speaking about that now. This promise is in connection with this age to come. And this is still future. And they could not reach there, they could not be introduced into this new age to come without us. Why this? Because we are linked with Christ. Christ is linked with us. And so when Christ will uh, inaugurate this new world to come, then we will be there, and then they will be there. Now there are many references, of course, in the scriptures which uh, could be introduced here, but I think when we go to the book of Revelation, when we see the, the 24 elders, we see there these Old Testament saints in heaven, and we will be there with them. So then they will be introduced and will be made perfect together with us. We see, and this is what we hope to see in chapter 12 also, that the Lord Jesus has reached that already. The thought is not that the Lord Jesus ever would have been imperfect, far be the thought but that he has reached perfection. In that sense, uh, as we see it in many uh, passages, I'm thinking now of chapter 7, for example, where we have seen um, that the word of the swearing of the oath, which is after the law, uh, constitutes a son perfected forever. So there we see the Lord Jesus in the glory, and he has finished the race and he has come to perfection. So far be the thought that there was something negative in the Lord's life. No, he has reached the finish and in that sense come to perfection. And so we will be brought to perfection and then with us the Old Testament saints when they will be raised from among the dead. Then in chapter 12, this encouragement which comes now. Let us also therefore. So, 
I think he links this with chapter 10, where we had these uh, exhortations that they needed endurance, that they needed uh, perseverance to do the will of God here in the wilderness, and instead of drawing back, continue. And then chapter 12 uh, follows that thought right away. And then chapter 11 would be as a great parenthesis in between, which shows us all the examples of the heroes of faith, which would um, underline the importance of false teaching here. And then after these illustrations of the Old Testament saints, he goes on to speak to the Hebrew Christians, and he joins them. He does not only speak to them, but he says, let us also therefore, and so we may apply it to ourselves also, um, the teaching which follows here. There are several things which he mentions here, mentions here. First of all, having so great a cloud of witnesses. So this cloud of witnesses, it's like a glorious cloud shining, and they are there to encourage us, not to criticize us because we are, have so many shortcomings, they are there to encourage us. Uh, it's like when you go to a university, an old university, and you see all these portraits of all these uh, old men and past generations. They have done a good job, and they are there to encourage you. And so these portraits in the gallery of faith of chapter 11 are there to encourage us. It's not, you could compare it also with a stadium, and then you see all these uh, people there, but it's not that they see us now. I don't think that is the thought. The thought is that they were there, and they are a reality for faith. We see a work of God in them, and it says they are a cloud of witnesses to encourage us, to be a witness to us, to show what God had worked in their life, and that is then an encouragement for us. They are not there to criticize us or just there as witnesses of what God has worked in them and as such to encourage us. God gives them the, as such. And so this cloud surrounds us. That is one thought. Then, the second thought is that we should lay aside every weight and sin. We are going to see several things here. We are going to see that in this race we have to do certain things to make a choice and then in the testing we hope to see that there are also things which you cannot do about anything. You just have to accept. But now first, things we can do. We can make a choice. Laying aside every weight. Now what does that mean? Is that uh, to lay aside our duties we have received uh, that we should do here on earth? I don't think so. Um, God has given us tasks and so the thought is not that we should stop doing these tasks I think when you start a race you will figure out for yourself what weights are weights are not necessarily bad things but there are things which hinder us in the race and you will find it out as, as soon as you start to run and what is this race it is simply following the Lord Jesus as you hope to see in chapter in verse 2 the race is following him we see that in a moment and so in order to do this in order to follow him effectively we have to lay aside every way now he's not going to give us a list of all the things we have to lay aside because that is a very personal matter only between the Lord and ourselves we know that for ourselves or we will find it out we will figure it out when we run the race when you read Philippians 3, for example, you will find out what Paul did. There were so many good things, but he laid them all aside because he followed the Lord Jesus in the race. So, uh, we may think of earthly blessings which are good in themselves, which may become a hindrance in the race. And so it's not a matter to introduce, to legislate here and to say to one another, now you have to stop doing this, you have to stop doing that. That's not the point. The point here is encouragement. Encouragement from what the Old Testament believers had experienced, the work of God in them. And then, following the Lord, we will give up everything which might be the weight. But there is not, there's another thing. Also, sin which so easily entangles us. Now, we should understand in this case all here, sin is something which comes from the outside, but which has a point of reference 
in us. And that makes us vulnerable. This the Lord Jesus did not have. He was uh, tested and he went to tri uh, trials. But there was in him no point of reference to sin. Not at all. So there is a great difference with the Lord Jesus. Um, but I think that in the context of the Hebrew Christians, what would be sin for them is unbelief, as it's mentioned in chapter 3 and 4, uh, through which the whole people was characterized, and also disobedience, self-will, or the tendency to fall back into Judaism. Uh, you could even uh, mention certain uh, privileges in Judaism which the uh, Hebrew Christians had and might become a weight but there was this danger as we have seen in this epistle that they would fall back into Judaism and that was uh, really unbelief that was disobedience that is sin and for in that context that was sin which easily entangled them which easily beset them because they were attracted to that system but it would have been apostasy, as we have seen in chapter 6 already, if they would do this. But it was something which easily beset them. Now, we may apply, of course, this principle to many other things. But I think as soon as self-will gets involved, uh, if we do not judge self, then we easily get entangled by all kinds of things which come from the outside. So, that is the second thing. The encouragement first by the cloud of witnesses, then laying aside, that is in a, in a sense a negative thing, laying aside every weight and sin, but then the encouragement, run with endurance. Now, the word run we find in many other scriptures, uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and other, where you see this race going on, and Philippians 3 I mentioned already, we have no problem to understand this but run with endurance. And that's what we have seen in the examples in chapter 11. And that is what the Hebrew Christians needed in chapter 10. He mentioned that very clearly. Endurance was, uh, was what they needed. And that's exactly what we need, endurance. It is a good thing to start the run of the race of faith. But it is a better thing to go on in the race of faith. To endure till the end. And now we will see many encouragements in connection with the person of the Lord to help us to endure. Now the word race is a word which uh, really could be translated in different ways. Contest, but the basic meaning is agony. You could translate it with an agony. This race becomes an agony. It is a very hard thing. It's not an easy thing. And we see these words, the same words, which I then translate with agony in many different passages in Scripture. For example, in Colossians 2, verse 1, where Paul is praying for the Colossians. He was really in agony about them. And so, the thought here would be that we would be in agony, that it's a, a battle of life and death to run this race. It's not just something you may happen to do, but it is a matter of life and death. That is the way he presents it here, using this word agony. Now, this race lies before us. He sees the believer here at the start. And he had said in chapter 5 already that they had become a little lazy. They had uh, held back. And so he sees them here at the beginning of the start, but now he encourages them to go on. And so this race is before us. But then, there is another thing before us. Or better, there is a person presented before our hearts. At the end of the race, there is the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus. He is seen, he is presented here as the one who came into the race, to run the race himself. And so you might say the Lord Jesus was the greatest hero of the faith. That is point one. But not only that, when he came, he was also the author of faith. He was the one who had worked that faith in all these heroes in chapter 11. He is the one who had worked in them. And so he is the author of of faith. And then he came himself. So therefore he became also a model. A perfect model. All these things are in chapter 11. We did not read about their shortcomings, but definitely they had shortcomings. But here the perfect model comes into the race himself. What an example. And not only that, then we see him as the finisher. He has endured. He has, come, he has reached the finish. The completer of faith. We have seen in chapter 2, verse 
9 already, the, and 10, the Lord Jesus is the leader who leads many sons to glory. That's the same word. The leader there um, of their salvation. He is the one who is the author of these things, but also who realizes all these things. He is the originator, and sometimes the word is translated with prince, so that shows him as the head, the chief. So many things in connection with the Lord Jesus. The hero, the chief, the one who started and who finishes, the one who conducts also, that's implied in the word prince or chief. He leads us. So many thoughts are connected with uh, this, but it's all connected with the blessed person of Jesus. This simple name. It's wonderful to study the, the epistle to the Hebrews and see nine times just the mentioning of his name. It fills our hearts when we see him. And so we are encouraged, and the Hebrew Christians in those days were encouraged just to look away. Now, look away from all the distractions. Of course, when you run a race, you cannot look around and see what's going on, because you will easily fall and stumble. You don't, look, you don't even look at the cloud of witnesses. Of course, they are there, and they encourage you. But you look not at them. You look at Jesus. He is the one who is presented there before our eyes. And the way he's presented here as the leader, the completer of faith is a wonderful encouragement. And as I said, he has reached the finish. We see in verse 2 at the end that he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is there permanently. That is the thought. It's a perfect, uh, perfect. So he he has set himself there, and he is there now. So he has finished. He has reached completion or perfection. And then we see how he did it, because, and what the motive was, in view of the joy lying before him. So God presented something for the Lord also. He showed the joy he would have. We see it also in Isaiah 53 when uh, many details about his sufferings are given. He saw what the fruit would be that rejoiced his soul. And so this joy of being in the presence of his father now, as, as a man also, and then with us there, the fruit of his work, this joy was before him and made him go all the way. And he endured the cross. Again, this word endurance. He received the perfect example in the Lord Jesus, how he endured the cross. It was for God's glory. It does not say the cross here. It is cross. So, the way he ran was even going through sufferings of cross. It's not here the, uh, the ex aspect of the Lord's um, the, the expiation, the, uh, the propitiation he accomplished. There he is unique. The, ex the, the thought here is that he is an example for us even in connection with the endurance of the cross. That is the thought here. And in that sense, we may follow him and we may take up a cross too. Uh, Peter was crucified and other believers have been crucified. In that sense, their faith, in their faith, they followed the example of the Lord Jesus. Not in connection with the sufferings uh, to redeem us. That's not a thought, but to follow his example. And it doesn't say that he despised the cross because the cross was also something God has given him. Of course, it was something man has given him. But God was over all. And he had, uh, we see it in the prophets already, foreseen the sufferings of the cross of his son. It was calculated, as it were, by God. Foreseen by God. And so he did not despise the cross. But he despised the shame. Whatever man could do to him, he would never give up. He would not even be influenced in that sense by it in a negative way that he might consider giving up. He just despised the shame. Well, you need to be very close to God in order to be able to do this. And then the result. Again, beloved, this is such a wonderful thought when you study Hebrews to see who is there at the right hand of God. He is there because of his personal glory. That is chapter 1, verse 3. There is such a great person there, a man who could enter heaven because he is the Son of God. There we see his personal glory, chapter 1, verse 3. But he's there also because God invites him. 
And then he is there, as we have seen, as the one who is there because he is the minister of the sanctuary. He's because he's there because of his service. And he's there because of the accomplished work, as we have seen in chapter 10. But there's another aspect here. He is there now because he finished the race. Another reason why he is there. He could uh, place himself there at the right hand of the throne of God. What a uh, elevated place. And he could do this because he finished the race. Well, what an example for us. To walk now. How do you say to Walk? To run with endurance the race that lies before us, the race of faith. That is the invitation, the challenge which comes to each one of us tonight. And in this, follow the Lord. Focusing, looking away from anything else. There's a wonderful tract which uh, deals with this thought. Look away from temptation, from trials. Okay. It's interesting, uh, we have no time to go into all the meanings of the different words Paul uses, but here in verse 3, the word there, consider, is make an analogy. It's very interesting to see that. He would like us to consider in a very consistent way, not just in a haphazard way, but sit down and consider him, this wonderful person. Make an analogy of his sufferings, also during his life. Make an analogy of what he is there in the glory, as we have just briefly mentioned. Consider him in such a way who endured, again this word, endured. Then, so great contradiction. Now we come to a second thought. We see, you see we have uh, to make a choice to lay aside the weight and sin which so easily entangles us. That is the choice we can make. But there, is, there are other things in the race of faith which are not object of our choice. When we are faithful, we will uh, be contradicted. When we walk uh, pleasing the Lord, there will be opposition. You cannot uh, avoid that. It. It's not a matter of choice. It's something which will come on the way to us. From sinners, it says here against himself. So I mentioned this is of course the Lord himself. But he is again an example. And these things will happen to us when we are faithful. But it's again an encouragement. When we consider him there. Who endured so great contradiction. Why? That ye be not weary fainting in your mind. Again I think this links with chapter 10. The danger was that he would draw back. That he would be so uh, depressed. Because of their sufferings, their afflictions, that they would give in. No, he says, consider him who endures, in order that you be not weary, fainting in your mind. And so then he comes to the second part we have tonight, these testing of faith. We have seen things which we may lay aside, and we do this because we are attracted to follow the Lord Jesus. That's the only way you can lay things aside. It's not a command. It is something you do automatically when you are in the race. But then, there are things which we receive, we have no choice, which come from the Father. Even these contradictions from sinners, God's in control. He allows this to form us. But now, there's a very important contrast with the Lord. Our blessed Lord did not need to lay aside certain things. And we mentioned also, uh, he never would be entangled by sin, because there was not a point of reference in him. So there's a contrast with the Lord. Uh, and even when he went through trials and tribulations, the Lord didn't need to lay aside certain things, as we do. And then there's a, a the second contrast, as you hope to see, in connection with the testings we go through. But the reasons for testings are always because God has to deal with the flesh in us. And so, whatever happens, God allows this, as we hope to see, to form us for himself, that we may become partakers of his holiness. Either in a preventive way, to prevent us from falling into sin, or to correct us, or to build us up, 
He may use different methods, discipline, chastening, scorching, whipping. And then the point is, as we hope to see in this passage, how do we react to this? Do we despise God's discipline? Do we faint? Or do we rebel? Are we not in subjection, but rebel? Or are we exercised by these disciplines, these forms of discipline? So we are at God's school here, right now. And I say to the children who are here, when you go to school, it's only for a few hours, you have different masters, different teachers, I mean, different instructors, but we are all the time at God's school. And we hope to see that he, why he does it. Um, so God's chastisement is to have us as true sons for himself. And so there is a parallel between the Father of Spirits, as he's mentioned here, and the Father of our flesh to bring us up. But there is also a difference, as you hope to see. The earthly fathers was only for a few days, and it seemed good to them, but our Heavenly Father is occupied with us all the time. He is disciplining us, teaching us, instructing us all the time. He makes no mistakes. And it is always possible. And then the conclusion, the objective is two ways to be partakers of His holiness and then to have this peaceful fruit of righteousness. So that's God's objective. But this is very practical tonight. Uh, it does not speak about our position, as we have seen in chapter 10, position of holiness, but it's very practical that we would respond now to God's thought. And therefore He has introduced us into His school to form us. So we have seen the race of faith and at the same time that goes on the testing of faith. I'm not suggesting first you have the race and then the testing. It goes on at the same time. And all these examples we have seen in chapter 11, we can learn from them uh, to run the race and to go through these testings. So now verse 4, ye have not resisted unto blood, wrestling against sin. It's a difficult verse. Uh, people think that um, they have to um, chastise themselves and even Unto, uh, until bleeding or other things because they have misunderstood this verse it's not to improve our flesh it's not to improve self the point here is that the believers were exposed to attacks coming from the outside they were in this race in this agony and it's remarkable that this word wrestling here in verse 4 is um, linked with this word agony so they had this race as an agony we see and now this wrestling took place at the same time. But it was not a wrestling uh, with a sin in us as we have in Romans 7. The soul is under the law or wants to improve itself. It is not set free yet. That is not the thought here. The thought here is that something comes from the outside which uh, surrounds us and which might affect us because there is still this point of reference in us and so he, uh, Paul says you have to resist unto blood uh, the pressures on uh, the side of Judaism were very great but still they had not come to the point that they had died as the Lord did he died literally in this wrestling it's not the battle as we have in Galatians 5 between uh, the spirit and the flesh. I mean, that is, in Galatians you see believers who have, set, have been set free, who are not under the law of Romans 7, who are free already, but then are uh, under the influence of the flesh again. And so the spirit and the flesh are uh, opposed, as we see in Galatians 5. That's not the, the battle here either. Or the battle as you have in Ephesians 6 against uh, the, the demons, against Satan's attacks, to take away the enjoyment of heavenly blessings. That's another battle. The battle here is that we are in this world and exposed to the attacks of the religious world, or in those days, Judaism, uh, and we are weak because there is a point of reference in ourselves. We have a tendency to give in, as we have seen many times. But we have seen also in chapter 4, the Lord Jesus is there to support us, that we would not give in that we would continue faithfully. So this is a hard battle, but not to improve self 
or to improve the flesh, but in connection with these attacks coming from outside, from around us. In verse 5 then, we see we are under these testings. And he explains this now. You have quite forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. So we are in God's school, under his testings. He allows this. He forms us. And he says, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. So I mentioned these four ways we can uh, respond to this. The first is despise. But notice here, uh, ye have quite forgotten the exhortation. What's that? He refers to the scriptures. Uh, it says here in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, uh, my son despise not the chastening of the Lord, or something to that extent. And so, this scriptures, God speaks through the scriptures to us. Solomon is speaking there to his own son. But here we see that it is God's word. And through Solomon, the scriptures speak to you and me. So that shows the value of the scriptures. We cannot overestimate the importance of the scriptures. The scriptures speak to us. In chapter 4 we see how the scriptures expose everything. The secrets of our hearts. It's God who exposes everything. But it is through his word. And so his word speaks also to us, as we find here. But then notice the context here, as to sons. I would really like to underline this very much. God wants sons. You see it in the Old Testament when he called uh, Israel that he would leave Egypt. He wanted to have sons. They, they are formed in the wilderness. That is what is the wilderness all about. God allows us to go through the wilderness. He leads us through the wilderness in order to form us to be sons in a practical sense. Of course, positionally, we are sons. God has chosen us to be sons and he has made us sons, Ephesians 1 and other passages. But now he wants us to be practically sons, to enjoy this sonship, this relationship with him. Therefore, he sends us to his school that we would be there to be instructed. Now, this word chastening, you could translate by instruction or discipline. You could read the Psalms of instruction, for example, in the Old Testament. They give many details how God would instruct his sons. And this uh, discipline may also uh, show itself in uh, another word, as we find it at the end of verse 5, reprove. God uh, rebukes even. But it is a form of discipline here. Or scourges or whips in verse 6. There are different forms of discipline. And we all need this. But he is in control. There are many beautiful scriptures. Uh, I cannot go into the details now. But which show this work of God to form us. To discipline us. To instruct us. It's a work of God in us. We have seen the work of God in Hebrews 11. In those saints. Now we see a work of God in you and me. Going on today. So he is the great instructor. And he wants to have us as sons. My son. Now the second uh, way of responding would be faint. In verse 5 at the end. Faint. We see maybe an example, practical example. In the Corinthians, they had a tendency to despise the chastening. You see, there are many references in 1 Corinthians which give us this impression. But the Thessalonians, when they were under, uh, going through these trials, they had a tendency to faint. And Paul did everything to encourage them, to lift them up, as it were. And then in verse 6, he gives an additional reason. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. It's very rare that the word love is used in Hebrews. So here we see how God would like to see us to be sons in a practical way. And now he instructs us and disciplines us because he loves us. And it's added he scourges every son whom he receives or in whom he has his delight. Now again a contrast with the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus never needed it. He was all the time a perfect son in whom the Father could delight. When he started his public ministry here, the heavens were opened and God would say, this is my beloved son in whom I, am, I have found my delight or in whom I am well pleased. 
he said it also to him, but also about him to the others. Seven times we have a reference to that in the New Testament. So, now, the Lord Jesus is there an example for how God would like to see you and me. So he brings in discipline to take away any hindrance. And he wants to, to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus, the Son who he could receive, the Son in whom he had a delight, a pleasure. And so, that's the reason why God brings in here testings and trials to discipline us, to form us, that we would respond to this and then be conformed as the image of the Lord Jesus. So we have seen him as the point of attraction, as the object for faith, the prize at the end of the race, but now we see him also as the son, the model son, and we are formed in the school of God after his image. Verse 7, ye endure for chastening, God conducts himself towards you as towards son. So you see how he is elaborating on this point. And again we have the relationship between Jehovah and Israel as an example for us in the Old Testament. So many Old Testament references could be given in this context. For who is the son that the father chastens not? So there is this relationship of love and that is the reason why the father disciplines. If he does not care about them, they would be like bastards. And I think these uh, professing Christians who had fallen back into Judaism, they were like bastards. They had not this relationship with God. And so, they were not exposed to these trials either. A bastard is not going through all these testings because the father would not take care of him. He could take care of a real son. Partakers. Uh, again, this word, uh, we have seen that we are partakers in connection with Christ and his glory. But now we see that we are partakers of Satan. We need that for our way through the wilderness. And then, we have mentioned this already, the contrast. There is a parallel between the father of spirits and the fathers of our flesh. But there are also many contrasts. The, the third uh, reaction I mentioned just briefly in verse 9, we could be rebels, not subject. But how many reasons do we have indeed to subject to the father of spirits? The father of spirits again underlines how he wants to have this relationship with sons. It's not just as the creator he is here the father uh, who has sons and so the result of this discipline is that we would live in his presence live in the enjoyment of this relationship so the contrast they indeed chastened for a few days be all the time they did it as seemed good to them but the Lord uh, God he is perfect and he knows what he's doing he never makes a mistake it's always for profit. With the earthly fathers, it's made sometimes even not for profit. But here, it's always for profit. And so now the objective, we see here these two points of um, the discipline. First is to be partakers of his holiness. Notice here, we are partakers of chastening, we are partakers of discipline. And that's in order that we may be partakers of his holiness. And there's a very special word used here for holiness. And uh, I think it refers here to the practical aspect of holiness. So not to the position. Uh, God, uh, through the work of the Lord Jesus, has sanctified us. Has given us a position of holiness. Which answers perfectly to his own holiness. But now through these testings, through these trials, through this discipline, he produces something in us that we would respond practically to his holiness that is what he wants he does not only want to give us a wonderful position and then just we go on our way and we forget about it he wants to enjoy our relationship that is why he brings us through all these things and therefore we become partakers of his holiness without holiness we cannot enjoy God's presence and the epistle to the Hebrews emphasizes much this aspect of holiness as the epistle to the Romans emphasizes the aspect of Righteousness. So, being in his presence, brought there, you can enjoy, now in a practical way, his presence. And verse 11 underlines it in a different way. But no chastening at the time seems to be a matter of joy. You've seen the joy which was before the Lord Jesus? He did not need testings. He didn't need chastening. He went through testings, but he ne never needed discipline. But there is something we have in common now with the Lord. This joy which is before us. The joy, which is the result of these testings and discipline. 
ultimately. So, what is a matter of grief for the moment becomes ultimately a matter of joy when the fruit is there, the result is there. Afterwards, yield. It's like a, um, a term in uh, agriculture when you have uh, the fruit, collect the fruit, there is this yielding, there is this produce. The product coming from the fields, as it were, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now here, notice, the, the first thing is, uh, as we have seen, holiness. The second thing is joy, as the ultimate result. But then, the third thing is the fruit of righteousness. And in the Greek, this is the order. And then, peaceful is an aspect which comes after. So first, righteousness, the fruit of righteousness. You find it in James 3, verse 17 and 18, uh, connected with peace, and you find it also in Philippians 3, verse 11, this fruit of righteousness, a result of the work of the Holy Spirit, a result of this heavenly wisdom when we are under the teaching of the Lord Jesus, the wisdom from above, but here now also a result of the Father's discipline. How wonderful this is, how the, the triune God is working to produce this fruit of righteousness in us. And there we have then how this happens? Because there is exercise. There are those who subject themselves to this discipline, who do not despise it, do not faint, but accept this discipline as coming from the Father and are exercised by it. This is God's school I mentioned. Now this is God's gymnasium. The word used here refers to uh, the exercises. People went through bodily exercises, and we have it also in our word gymnasium. Uh, this kind of college, so spiritual exercises, God wants us to be exercised to respond to his thoughts. And that needs his testing, needs his discipline, needs constant exercise, as we have seen. But the result is wonderful. And then this peace comes in. And I'd like to close with this thought. It is already an element of the coming age. You remember how the coming age, the Lord Jesus will reign, there will be a reign of peace and righteousness. We have seen it in Melchizedek, the prince or the king of, uh, his name means uh, king of righteousness, but he was also the king of Salem, means the city of peace. And so, in the millennium, the Lord Jesus will introduce this righteousness and peace. But we enjoy now already, as a result of his father's discipline, we enjoy already this righteousness and peace. Already now, today, when we are exercised, when we are here in God's presence and accept these testings and disciplines coming from his hand. So how blessed are we really but that we may enjoy practically what in the future, in the millennium, people will enjoy here on earth. So I realize many more things could have been said and it's, it's a very important passage uh, but uh, I'd like to give some time for additional uh, remarks or questions and the next time we will see then in verses 12 to 17 the practical results of this exercise in God's school, but we have no time to go into that now. So if you have questions, I do not guarantee an answer, but just try. Yes, all of us, no exception. But, of course, the way God uses, the methods he uses, he adapts to our needs. We see that in the New Testament, Paul, he went through very hard training. And we see it also, literally, in connection with this race, the people went through a very hard training. There was no exception. Everybody had to go through these exercises and through these trainings. But the way, of course, the Father applies these methods is different. And the, the, even the methods are different. He uses a different method for me than for you. But Paul has to go through this. Unless you would reject it and be like a bastard, but we all like to be true sons. And so we have to go through that. Yes. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, ultimately, there is a link, uh, because 
All the promises of God can only be fulfilled on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection. But I think the promises here in verse 13 were linked with the land. God promised the land to Abraham. And in connection with that, a seed, descendants. In connection with that, of course, also the Messiah who was to come and who we see in, the, in Isaac already. But all these promises, the fulfillment at least, they did not receive because God had something better in view, also for them. And during their life, they, re- they realized that God had something better in view. We have seen that when we studied verses 8 and so on, uh, that although they were brought into the land of promise, when they were there, they dwelt there as, uh, as strangers, as foreigners, because they realized then that even there, being in the land, the real promise was still future. And, and it's still future, as we've mentioned. Um, well, you might do that, but uh, as long as you understand that in the context of Hebrews, the promise is only to be fulfilled when, in connection with Christ's coming and sacrifice, and in connection with his return when the millennial reign will be introduced. Then the promise will be fulfilled, not earlier. I agree with you, but and that's the thing is hope too. Because they are linked with Christ. We are not important in ourselves, but the point is we are intimately linked with Christ. hold fast the boldness and the boast of hope firm to the end. Um, yeah, I think so, but who am I? <laughs> I have no problem to uh, link it with the promise here too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially when you understand that we are in the wilderness, and this is a wilderness epistle, shows that we are in the wilderness and therefore go through all these testings and this race, then we see that at the end of this wilderness journey, the fulfillment of the promises, uh, the hope uh, becomes realized and so on. And we have we seen in chapter 6, the guarantee is that Christ is already there. And another guarantee we have seen tonight here, uh, that he is seated at God's right hand. So that is the guarantee that we will be there ultimately. So, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much.